Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to South. And if you're new here, we're really grateful that you decided to come. My name is Seth. This is Neil, Natalie. We and the rest of the band are going to lead through some worship songs just to tell Jesus we love him, we're thankful for him. We're going to invite you all to join us in that. So why don't you stand up, and we'll sing these songs out together. Oh, don't lose heart, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm. Oh, don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. Let's sing this out together, there is a King of glory. There is a King. our praise. We're going to continue worshiping him, continue singing to him this morning. We want to invite him to move in this place. That's what we're going to do through this next song. I'd love for you to jump in and sing along with us.
of all generations. We thank you that you are a king of glory that is worthy and deserving of our praise and of our worship. We know that true change, true movement in our lives only comes through you. But despite our very best efforts, it's only through you, Jesus, that our hearts can truly change and our lives can truly change. Lord, thank you for the grace and the peace and the joy and the love and the hope that we're able to rest in through your name. Thank you for the fact that we get to worship you together as a congregation. You've given us the ability to interact with you and praise you through song and through worship. And I pray through this next little bit of time that we can just learn together and look more like you uh, and just grow more towards Jesus together. We love you so much. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Really grateful that you all are here. You all can go ahead and take a seat. Well, good morning and welcome to Southland. My name is Dusty, and I have the privilege of serving on staff as our high school pastor here at the Nicholsville campus, and we are just really glad and grateful that you're here with us today. And as you probably are aware, over the past few days, eastern Kentucky has been hit with just some devastating flooding that's impacted so many people, lots of whom we know and we love, and uh, we just wanted to start off by praying for them today. So could you guys join me and let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are near to those with heavy and broken hearts. Um, We pray specifically today on behalf of our our brothers and sisters in eastern Kentucky. Um, We just ask that you would be near to them and bring them comfort. 
we also pray for strength for today, the strength that they need to, to walk through today and then again for tomorrow. And we pray for provision. Will you provide for the needs that they have right now and the needs that will come up in the days and the weeks to follow as they recover from this. We just pray that they would get to know you more as their provider. We also pray for churches and ministries in the area to know how to serve and come alongside people and how to show people your love in this time. So we love you and we trust you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been in contact with local officials and leaders as well as our church plants in the area to know how to best come alongside and serve people. So if you want to join us in that, you can head over to southland.church slash response for the most updated ways that we as a church are going to um, be sending teams and lending aid. Uh, so you can find all of that there on our website. But thank you for keeping our friends and our neighbors in eastern Kentucky in your prayers. Well, you know as well as I do, when we go through difficulty or when we see difficulty around us, a lot of times one of the things that's highlighted is how much we need each other. We need people in our lives to encourage us and sometimes to challenge us, especially as we follow Jesus. And you'll hear us say around here that we just believe life is better with Jesus in community and on mission. And that in community part is so important. Well, me and my wife, Melissa, about a year ago, we wanted to invest intentionally in some of these relationships, so we joined a Southland group. And that group now has seven different couples, um, and it's been incredible. We've gotten to know people who are in the same season of parenting as us, some people who are a little further down the road and have been parenting longer than us, but also some, some newlywed couples who are now stepping into being parents for the first time. And as much as we've been blessed by this group, one of the main things is we've experienced love through these people unlike any other season of our life. And not only do we have these relationships with them now, but we've also been given a picture of God the Father that has deepened our relationship with him. And that is the kind of community that's developed and built in Southland groups every single week. So as summer is coming to a close, we want to be able to launch as many of these groups as possible so that people can find that kind of community and that kind of connection. But in order to do that, we're going to need people to step in and lead those groups. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know about leading. That sounds intimidating. Let me just tell you, it's not. You don't have to know all of the stuff. You don't have to be an expert on anything. You certainly don't have to have all of your stuff together because none of us do. But what it does take is willingness. It takes a willingness to allow God to use you to open up a safe space, to create a spot where people can come and share and belong so that they can get to know Jesus better. So if that sounds fun to you, or if that sounds like maybe a challenge that God could be leading you toward, I just want to encourage you to stop by the help desk on your way out and talk to somebody from our team about it. You can also head over to southland.church slash groups to find out more about our groups model and all the groups that are going to be offered. But we, we just encourage you to be a part of helping to create that kind of community for other people um, if you've experienced it yourself. So as fall is approaching, one of the things that is coming up is students are about to go back to school. And if you're a student, you're probably like, I don't want to talk about that yet. But the truth, the reality is it's coming. And we want to make sure you know about an opportunity to live on mission this fall. As a church, we have a school mentorship program, and basically what happens is adult volunteers are paired with someone from one of our local school partners, with a child from one of our local school partners. And throughout the semester, they go to the school one time per week for 30 minutes each week. Okay, and the relationships that are built with these kids a lot of times go beyond the school year and sometimes even as, as those kids go into middle school and high school. And just recently, one of our volunteer mentors had the privilege of baptizing someone that he had walked with through this program for about nine years. Nine years. So, yeah, that's, that's worth celebrating. So what, what seems like a small 30 minutes can have a really big impact. So if you think that could be you, head over to southland.church slash volunteer, or again, stop by the help desk, and someone can help you take your next step in that. Well, we're continuing on in our series, Road Warriors, today, and Scott's got a great message. So go ahead and get your Bible out. We're going to join up with the rest of our campuses for today's teaching.
Well, one of my best friends likes to make fun of me because he says that I can't preach a sermon without a sports illustration or 10 in any given sermon. And he's not necessarily wrong. I'm pretty much comfortable in my own skin. I tend to see the world through three primary filters. The first is the Bible. The second is marriage and family and parenting. And the third is sports. And so he's, he's not wrong in that at all. When I was a kid, uh, my dad lived in Indianapolis for a little while, and he lived for a while in this apartment complex that had a uh, basketball court in between the buildings. And so when I would go stay with him in the summers, I would literally be out on that court from sun up till sun down. And I learned a lot of things on that playground, probably a lot of things I shouldn't have learned at a very young age. But I also learned a specific brand of basketball. I learned the brand of basketball where you uh, grow accustomed to navigating around the potholes and divots in the blacktop. Uh, You never take an ill-advised jump shot, especially on a windy day, and the defense always calls the fouls. And you know that that means the game's going to get pretty rough. And oftentimes there would be a conflict or a dispute like there is in any kind of pickup basketball game where the ball would go out of bounds and one dude would point at another and go out on you, bro, and the other would say kindly, no, kind sir, that ball did not bounce off of me. No, it didn't go like that at all, but I can't say what was actually said on the playground, but you know what was probably said. Inevitably, somebody would grab the ball and they would go shoot for it, and so they would shoot for it, and if the person shooting made the shot, they would say this phrase, ball don't lie. And if they missed it, then somebody from the other team would say, ball don't lie. And I would contend that we all are tired of these 10-minute reviews, and if we would just shoot for it, that would make the game go a whole lot faster, but nobody's asking for my advice. One of the things that I love about sports is there's standards. There's a basket, there's a goal, there's an end zone, there's, there's goal posts, there's yards to be gained, there's fair balls, there's foul balls, there's strikes, and there's balls, and standards are important in sports. Now, as much as I hate to reference Indiana basketball, I'm going to today, I grew up in the 80s watching a movie called Hoosiers, like many of us did, and I basically got it memorized. If you don't know the story, it's about the Indiana State basketball tournament, and a small team from the middle of nowhere goes all the way to the state championship game in Indianapolis. And when the team walks into Hinkle Fieldhouse for the first time, they're just absolutely awestruck, And the coach does this. Check it out. into the backboard. What is it? 15 feet. 15 feet. Strap, put Ollie on your shoulders. Measure this uh, from the rim. Buddy? How far? Ten feet. Ten feet. I think you'll find it's the exact same measurements as our gym back in Hickory. (laughs) Okay, let's get dressed for practice. So what's he doing there? He's saying, despite the fact that we're a small team from the middle of nowhere in a big gym in a big city, the standard is still the standard. And that's important. Tucked away in your Old Testament, there's a little book of the Bible named after the person who authored it, named Amos. And Amos was a nobody, a nobody from nowhere who was called onto the national stage to deliver a message to God's people. And the message was this, you haven't measured up to God's standard. You haven't measured up to God's standard, and Amos comes on the scene before all the things that we've talked about in this series happened, before all the destruction, before all the invasions, before the exiles get taken away, and he predicts that all of it's going to occur. And this is the way it played out. This message was given to Amos, a shepherd from the town of Tekoa in Judah. This is what he saw and heard. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and thunder 
from Jerusalem. The lush pastures of the shepherds will dry up. The grass on Mount Carmel will wither and die. And that doesn't sound like good news, does it? I mean, this guy, this guy Amos, you need to understand, he is not a polished preacher like you see standing before you today. I mean, he, he is a shepherd. He's a farmer, man. He's, he's not going to pull any punches. He's, when he speaks about God being like a, a roaring lion, he's probably speaking out of experience with roaring lions. He has a serious message to deliver from a serious God, and what he has to say is really, really important, so he wants everybody to listen up. And then he proceeds to make these pronouncements of judgment on all these neighboring cities and nations and areas that surround the nation of Israel. Now this is something that's really important to notice. He does this in a specific order. He pronounces judgment on Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Now this is a map of what... uh, The nation of Israel and Judah looked at in the day of Amos, keeping in mind the nation has been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Judah and Israel. And Amos is from this little town called Tekoa that's kind of right in the heart, just a little bit south of Jerusalem, which is definitely the heartbeat of the nation. And so Amos preaches this sermon, and the first place that he pronounces judgment on is this place way up here in Damascus. And so when he pronounces judgment on Damascus, everybody listening to the sermon would have been like, Nah, who cares? Who cares about what happens to those people way up there? After all, we're way down here. Now, the very next place he pronounces judgment on is this place called Gaza. Now, Gaza is in the land that's historically known as the land of the Philistines. That's where all the bad people like Goliath hang out and all the people that Samson was always picking fights with. And so the reaction of the people would have been something like, well, good, awesome. We're glad God's going to get those people. The next place he pronounces judgment is this place called Tyre. Now, this is historically uh, where a very famous person named Jezebel is from. If you're expecting a baby girl, scratch that name off the list, okay? Jezebel was the most wicked queen in the history of the nation of Israel. And so everybody hears this and is like, well, fantastic. Get rid of the bad place that produces bad people like that. And then he proceeds to pronounce judgment in quick succession on Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Now, for those who were... Uh, either well-traveled or just relatively, you know, adept at geography. Maybe they woke up every morning and did Wordle on their iPhones. They might have noticed uh, that God was zeroing in on Jerusalem. See, everybody would have been clapping along with this sermon until they realized, oh man, he's painting a target on Judah and Israel. Everybody would have been really excited about this sermon right up until that point where he said Moab, but everything after that they wouldn't have liked. Now, in high school baseball now, they let the boys pick their own walk-up song, and I've been trying to convince some of the boys on my son's high school baseball team uh, to choose uh, Johnny Cash's God's Gonna Cut You Down to be their walk-up song because it's just really unsettling and super intimidating, and that's the song that everybody would have been singing in the middle of Amos' sermon Until he said this, this is what the Lord says, the people of Judah have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They've rejected the instruction of the Lord, refusing to obey his decrees. They've been led astray by the same lies that deceived their ancestors, so I will send down fire on Judah, and all the fortresses of Jerusalem will be destroyed. And when you're led astray by lies, that means you've abandoned something, and the thing that you've abandoned is called truth. So the primary sin of the southern kingdom was abandoning God's standards. They failed to believe the right things, but it doesn't stop there. This is what the Lord says. The people of Israel have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They will sell honorable people for silver, poor people for a pair of sandals. They trample helpless people in the dust, and they shove the oppressed out of the way. And when you trample on the helpless, and when you shove the oppressed, that means you've abandoned something. And that thing that you've abandoned is called justice. This. So the primary sin of the northern kingdom was abandoning the oppressed. They failed to do the right things. So you got one kingdom over here that's abandoned truth. They failed to believe the right things. Another kingdom over here that's abandoned justice. They failed to do the right things. And truth and justice are powerful words. And one of them in our day is immensely popular. And the other one is immensely unpopular. But the contention that I want to make today is that you can't have the popular one without the unpopular one. What I mean is this. You can't have justice without truth. 
You can't have justice without truth. We won't do a show of hands, but just let me ask you these questions to kind of get at what I'm, I'm getting at today. How, how many of you think it's wrong to steal from others? How many of you think it's wrong for men to abuse women? How many of you think it's wrong uh, for one group of people to marginalize another group of people based on the color of their skin? And I would venture a guess that most of us across all of our campuses agree with those three statements. And my question is, why? Why? Why is it wrong to steal from others? Why is it wrong for men to abuse women? Why is it wrong to devalue people and marginalize them based on the color of their skin and prevent them from pursuing life, liberty, and happiness? Who gets to set that standard upon which we make such bold judgments? Who says? Why? And who says? We've got to understand this historically speaking, man. There are still many cultures today who would not buy into those ideas at all. There are plenty of places that we could travel to right now. I could take you to places that I've been to like Afghanistan where women are treated as property. And they're told they must cover up their bodies from head to toe every day in sweltering heat with no air conditioning in sight. And the question becomes, is that morally wrong or is that just a beautiful cultural expression? And by what standard would you make your determination and who's the one who says? We don't have to go that far. We can go to New Jersey. I don't know why we would go there, but we could go to New Jersey and we could go to the hallowed halls of Princeton University and we could attend an ethics class there where a tenured professor named Peter Singer has been for a long time, famous author, his most famous book is called Animal Liberation. And in that ethics class, we would hear Peter Singer teach things like this. A weak old baby is not a rational and self-conscious being. And there are many non-human animals whose rationality and self-consciousness, awareness, capacity, and so on exceed that of a human baby a week or a month old. Life of a newborn baby is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. And that's what leads him to be a proponent of infanticide and an opponent of killing most animals. And the question becomes, why does that make your blood boil? I was in the NICU at UK yesterday. Peter Singer would walk the halls, and if he was being honest, he would say, what's all the fuss about? Why all the effort? And my question remains, why is he wrong? And again, we've got to understand that historically speaking, statements like the one that I just read to you that came out of his mouth that he put pen to paper to write down would have made perfect sense to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of cultures. The very idea that the strong shouldn't abuse the weak, that the rich shouldn't take advantage of the poor, and that all people have equal value would have sounded absolutely absurd to the ears of any person who was a Roman citizen in the days of Jesus would have sounded appalling to most tribal cultures and certainly would have sounded outlandish to all the neighboring nations of Judah and Israel in the days of Amos. But let me tell you who it should have made total sense to, Israel and Judah, because they had the scriptures. And the scriptures began with these four words, in the beginning, God. And we talked about this at the beginning of the year in our Beautiful Fences series. Those four words, if we believe them, change everything. Because upon the foundation of those first four words of the Bible is built the things that you and I value so much. Things like truth and beauty and goodness and the things that are built on that, like morality and justice and compassion and art and science and a million other things that we value. It should have made perfect sense to them. See, the reality is this. If there is no God, then no lives matter. If there is no God, then no lives matter. And that may sound harsh, but guess what? The universe doesn't care how harsh that sounds. The universe doesn't care a thing about my feelings or your feelings. All the things that you and I cherish and care about, things that matter to us like love, no, 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 if this is true, then all that is is some synapses firing in our brain. It's just an illusion, a chemical thing going on in there to further our species. And all the people sitting around you, all they are is either potential rivals to your survival or assets to your survival, nothing more. 
You see, the, the reason that our culture can't seem to figure this justice thing out is because our culture is trying to do something that Martin Luther King Jr. would have never dreamed of doing. He would have never dreamed of divorcing justice from Jesus. But don't take my word for it. Listen to his words. Evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ the cross, but the same Christ will rise up and split history into A.D. and B.C., so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. Yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that's the part of the quote everybody puts on Facebook, especially around January 15th. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But everybody forgets about the part that preceded it. You see, Martin Luther King Jr. would have never dreamed of anchoring morality or the universe itself or justice in anything other than a person, and his name is Jesus. There's a book, and I know you guys get tired of me recommending books, so I'll try to stop doing that so much, but there's a book that I don't want to, I don't want to just recommend this book. I actually want to humbly challenge our whole church to read this book. Get this book and read this book. Every now and then a book will come along uh, that will simply, clearly, and most importantly, biblically address the most prevalent issues of our day. And in that way, a book like that is very prophetic, which the literal word prophetic means to tell the truth. And so it tells the truth. This book is called The Secular Creed. Um, It's written by Rebecca McLaughlin. And I highly, highly, highly want to say, please get this book and read it. And if, if cost is an issue, just email me and we'll figure that out, all right? So don't let that be a barrier for anybody. But here's a sample of what she says in it. When a poor man from a historically oppressed racial and religious group claimed to be God in human flesh, commanded love for society's most vulnerable, and died a slave's death on a Roman cross, he made the poor, oppressed, and victimized forever central to God's moral plan. So the idea that all human lives have value comes directly from the God of the Bible. He's the one who makes that clear to us because right after those first four words, in the beginning God, we get these beautiful words. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So the reason that we all have such a strong sense of justice that seems to be hardwired into us, could it be that that's because we were made in the image of our creator? And could it be that the reason that we have this tendency to make such a mess of things is that we try to apply justice apart from Jesus? Let me say it this way. What's this? It's a crooked line. How do you know that? Probably because you know what this is. It's a straight line. You can recognize the crooked line because you've seen a straight line, and that's called a standard comparison. Interestingly, in Amos chapter 7, Amos goes to the very heart of the nation of Israel and Judah, a place called Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Historically, this place was just rich with history because this was the place that that father Abraham guy set up camp and and God made his covenant with him and said, this is going to be the promised land that I'm going to give to all of your descendants. So if ever there was a place that should be dedicated to the worship of the one true God, it's Bethel. But in Amos's day, it had been turned into a cheap flea market of false gods and idols. And so the message that Amos delivers from message or from from Bethel is this. Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I answered, a plumb line. The Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined. The temples of Israel will be destroyed. And I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. This is what a plumb line looks like. It's weighted at the end, and when you let the weight settle and you tie the line or hold the line next to a wall, it reveals whether the wall is leaning or not. So what God's doing in this moment is he's setting up a standard and he's saying to his people, you're leaning and you're on the verge of collapse, and if you don't come into conformity with the standard, you will be utterly destroyed and you will fall apart. And so the question becomes for God's people, what will they do? You see, in basketball, perhaps it's true that ball don't lie. In life, we need to understand this. God don't lie. 
And sometimes the truth is really, really hard to hear, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to hear it. In fact, it's even more vital that we do hear it when it's hard to hear. And the message of Amos is not that this only happens out there among all the bad people, and this only happens out there among all those pagan people who worship false gods. The message of Amos is that this happens in here among God's people who worship the one true God. And when it does, not only does God notice, but he roars things like this. I hate all your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and your solemn assemblies. I will not even accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. In other words, our songs of worship in here are only music to God's ears when they're accompanied by justice and righteousness out there. We don't ever want to be a church that's only known for singing songs. We want to be known as a church that sings songs and serves people. And that has always been the case for this church, and I pray that it always is. That's why in the New Testament, Jesus' half-brother James says it this way, pure and genuine religion, and that word religion literally translates worship, pure and genuine worship or religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. In other words, the kind of worship that our God and Father looks at and goes, oh, that's it. That reflects my heart. That reflects the deepest yearning and longing. My deepest desires is the kind of worship that gets right up next to and takes care of the fatherless, that protects the unprotected, that reaches out to the vulnerable and the marginalized among us. And don't miss this. This is anchored in refusing to let the world corrupt you. There's so much pressure for us to abandon truth but when we abandon truth we lose justice and so we have to hold on to both of those things with everything that we have because if there is no truth there's no such thing as a marginalized person all there is is a bunch of mammals fighting each other to get ahead for about 75 years before death ushers us into total nothingness if there is no truth then the grave has the final say. But the message of Amos is from God roaring, seek me and live. Hate evil, love what is good, turn your courts into true halls of justice. That's a picture of a good way to live. Seek God, hate evil, love good, do justice. And what I want you to notice is, is that we lose the hate evil, the love good, and the do justice part when we abandon the seek God part. When we leave the seek God part behind, we don't get to claim all these other things and we don't get all of these other things. In other words, we can't simultaneously celebrate evil and demand justice at the same time. It means that you don't do evil to someone and then call it justice. It means that we refuse to play word games because God sees through word games. It means you don't try to solve sin problems with more sin. You don't solve the sin problem of racism with more racism. You don't solve the sin problem of sexism with sexism and you don't solve the sin problem of oppression with more oppression and then call it justice that's a word game if we hate evil we hate it in all forms not just the ones that are fashionable to hate on on the red carpets of hollywood award shows and political debate or in university classrooms most importantly if we're supposed to recognize all the crooked lines that culture crams down our throats, we have to fix our attention, fix our eyes on the straight line standard bearer named Jesus. Remember the premise of this series. The point of the prophets is to pave the way for Jesus through their preaching and their prediction. And Amos certainly did that. See, Amos was basically the predecessor to a verse found in Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. And that word, that word all, guess what that means literally? All. Me, especially me. You. None of us have all perfectly believed the right thing at the right time in the right way for our entire lives. None of us have always done the right thing at the right time in the right way for our entire lives. The standard is perfection. 
in every way, shape, and form, and form. And we all fall desperately short. And that is bad news, isn't it? But fortunately, it's not the only news. A preacher named Alistair Begg says this so well. Listen to him. If you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, We've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him. How did that shake out for you? Because you were, you, were, you, were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You've never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Think I'll get the supervisor ranger. So, we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you are you are you are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? The guy said, "I've never heard of it in my life." And and what about? Let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> now, now that's the, that is the only answer. That is the only answer. Yeah. The man on the middle cross said, I can come. The answer on that day is not, I measured up to your glorious standard because I was so good. The answer is, Jesus measured up for me because I was so bad. You see the difference? Jesus came specifically for me and for you, those of us who don't measure up. And what he did was he came to unite justice and mercy on a cross and out of that wedding a thing called grace was born let me tell you about this thing called grace and it is wide and it is deep and it is so powerful that it keeps sin satan and death at bay back at the beginning of the summer we did this thing called beach week with all of our high school students and we've told you a lot about it and for my sermon that week, the worship team came to me and said, hey, uh, when, you're, when you're done with your sermon, we're going to sing this song, and we want you to listen to it. And I'd never heard it before, and so I listened to it as I was preparing that sermon. And you know how this works. Like, every now and then a song will just, like, ratchet itself to your heart and fix itself in your mind, and it's definitely done that for me. And then a couple weeks ago, I was out in Colorado preaching, and they sang this song, and I thought, you know, we need to be singing this song here. So here in a few minutes, we're going to sing it, but I want you to take notice of a few different phrases, and the whole song is so powerful, but here's the ones that stand out to me. There's this line that says, find me now where your grace runs as deep as your scars. So when we sing those words to Jesus, let me tell you how deep his scars are and his grace is deeper than your sin, far deeper than your shame. Then there's these lines, sin has no hold on me, because your grace holds me now. And that grace owns the ground where the grave did. You didn't measure up, but Jesus measures up for you. So now sin, Satan, and death have no claim on you because grace owns the ground where you now stand because Jesus purchased that ground with his blood. Let's stand and pray together and then sing these words. Father, 
Father, we come before you and we're thankful for your grace, your mercy, your love. We're thankful that you united justice and mercy on the cross and out of that flows grace. And that grace owns the ground that we now stand on, grace that was purchased by your son Jesus and the price was his blood and his body. So Father, our confidence is not in ourselves, it's not in our own goodness, it's not in our own behavior, it's not in our own competence, it's in your son Jesus, him and him alone, in his beautiful name we pray, amen.
You all can go ahead and have a seat. Well, before we continue in worship this morning, we're going to pause and take a second to take communion together as a church family. And communion is where we take a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice, and we remember that sacrifice that Jesus made for us, that Scott talked about where he provided grace. So this time we get to express gratitude to Jesus for that sacrifice. And if this is new to you, don't feel like you have to participate this morning. We're going to have scripture slides on the screen that you can reflect on over this time. And hey, I also want to let you know that we are a church that would love to pray for you. And so we've got a number on the screen that you can text your prayer into this morning. And our team will begin praying for that right away. And if you'd like to pray uh, in person, one-on-one -on -one with someone, we're going to have our prayer team down front at the end of the service, and they would love to pray with you and for you this morning. But no matter where we're, where we're at, where you're at this morning, let's all just take a moment to pause, take a deep breath, and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, what that means for us and what that means for you. You all stand. Let's continue worshiping together this morning.
Grab a seat as we celebrate these baptisms this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are so excited to have Abby here this morning with her dad, Aaron. Will you just encourage her in this incredible decision? I have had the enormous pleasure of being Abby's small group leader in middle school, and Abby is just one of a kind. She is wise beyond her years. She deeply loves the people around her. She's an incredible sister and friend uh, and follower of Jesus. I mean, Abby has a heart like no other, and I'm sure her dad can echo that. Um, it has just been such a joy to watch your faith grow, and you've made the best decision that you could possibly make. Um, so now I have a couple of questions to ask you. They're pretty easy. I right. Just repeat after me. All right. um, I believe. I believe. With all my heart. With all my heart. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. My Lord, my Lord, and my Savior. And my Savior. Well, upon that confession of faith, it is now our pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. <laughs> of being her small group leader here on Wednesday's night. 
Um, Taylor is a very dedicated individual. She goes not just on Wednesday nights, she comes on Sundays. She goes to other youth groups throughout the community and she invests in her relationship in Jesus in so many ways that it's been such an honor to watch it grow. So now Taylor's made the decision to get baptized. So please repeat after me. I believe. I believe. With all my heart. With all my heart. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Based on this confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death. Burial. Resurrection. <laughs> There is no better way to end the service than that. Y'all, thanks for being here with us this morning. Our prayer team's gonna be down front. They would love to pray with you and for you. We're wrapping up our series, Road Warriors, next week. Bring your friend. Hope you all have a great week. We'll see you back here next weekend.